Hey everyone, Pastor Kevin, listen, today I have a word from the Lord that I believe is going to be a blessing to your life, strengthen you in your journey. All of us need a shot in the arm in our faith, and I believe that word today is going to do that. Take the next few minutes, spread the word, tell your friends and family this message is coming on. I'm believing it's going to change our lives, and I want you to hang on till the end. I'm going to come back and pray for your needs, and I believe God's going to touch today. Let's jump into this word and be blessed. I'll be back soon. Can you stand for the word? Somebody's like, can we please not stand anymore? Well, after this, if you stand anymore, it'll be because you want to stand. Amen. Help me welcome our Athens family. Come on, tell Pastor Chris and Amy and the whole family that we love you. Believe in God for great things in Athens. It's already happening in Cleveland. We're believing it for Chattanooga, for Uruguay, for Bulgaria, for Guatemala, for every place God's given us part of the family. How many thankful for what God's doing in the nations of the earth? How many glad we're a part of it? Somebody say amen. I'm going to uh, take your Bible and go to Psalm 32. Um, before I preach today, I... I I have a spiritual daughter. Um, she sent me a message yesterday, and um, she's from Pakistan. I will not say where. Um, her name is Yasmin, and her and her precious husband and her babies, they pastor uh, a church in Pakistan that is a, a daughter church of ours, and we, you help support them every single month. We give money to their orphan program, to their children program, to their... Uh, program for rescuing women. And so every Sunday when you give, you're helping us to minister in the nation of Pakistan. I was out yesterday getting a few things and I, I heard a notification come through and I looked at my phone and it said, Dear Papa, which is what she calls me. She said, Dear Papa, uh, we need prayer. Uh, they are singling out Christians now. I don't know if you've heard this recently or not, but Pakistan has suddenly become very violent toward Christians. And she's tr she said, we're trying to figure out what to do because they're burning places down. And uh, this family has beautiful children. They have a beautiful church and she's the pastor. It is exploding. I, I could show you pictures and videos of what is happening there. And um, they were due to come to Ruach this year. We're still hoping that happens. But there has been a real turning up of persecution. And I was overcome yesterday with just a burden to pray for her and for her husband and for that great church there. And she said, we're trying to figure out if we can have church tomorrow. And I was trying to give her wisdom. She was wanting wisdom. Um, how many will pray? Take maybe a, just a few minutes at the beginning of this, and and and, and I can preach. I'm, I have a message to preach, but I want to pray for Pastor Yasmin today for the Lord to protect her and her family and to strengthen their faith. And sometimes, you know, we're just so aloof to this because we have such freedom, and sometimes I think we're guilty of taking that for granted. But we have brothers and sisters in the church across this world who gather in threat of loss of life even every single Sunday. I can't have church in here thinking that they're going through persecution there without praying for them. Would you pray with me for yeah, Pastor Yasmin and her husband and her children and her church? Abba, protect her. Protect her family. Protect their church. Jesus, I pray for their faith that it would not fail them. I know that you are interceding for them and we are calling for angels from heaven to go and be with Pastor Yasmin. Lord, she is a fierce lion. She has no fear. She is bold as a lion, but she's asking you for wisdom and I am praying for your wisdom to be her portion this morning. Give her guidance, give her wisdom, and I pray for just an assembly of angels to gather around that church and family today. Jesus, I thank you that the power of the Holy Ghost is gonna move among those believers. I need someone to get an agreement with me right there. The power of the Holy Spirit is gonna move in that church today. I pray for the government of Pakistan now. I pray for these people who are rising up in persecution against the people of God. I pray, Lord, today, as you did with King Herod, and we talked about it last week, Lord, if those people don't repent, I pray you would 
would remove their threat from the church. May the kingdom be advanced in Pakistan. May the church grow and increase. May the people of God come into blessing in the name of the Lord. And I pray for Pastor Yasmin today, God. Grant her a measure of grace and mercy and a fresh anointing. Jesus, we love you. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And we declare she is safe, protected, and kept whole now. In Jesus' name, and if you're in agreement, say amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. For a few minutes this morning, I want us to look at the 32nd chapter of the book of Psalm. And I felt the Lord quicken this assignment in my heart for someone in this room today, someone watching at Athens today, somebody who will be at Chattanooga today. I want to talk about recovering from failure. Look at somebody, tell them you can recover. Now, listen, let me help you understand something. If you're going to act like you ain't got nothing to recover from when you fall down, this message ain't going to help you. And people who come to church playing like they're standing up but are really falling down, they need to come to truth, come to reality and say it's time to get up. How many know you don't have to walk through life deceiving people because you might fool us, but you can't fool God? And if you've fallen down, I want you to know today the good news is you don't have to stay down or lay down. You can get up in the name of the Lord. But I want to talk about how we get up when we fall down. I want to talk about recovering from seasons of sin. I want to talk about the hope that you have for tomorrow because of the goodness of God. And I want to tell somebody in this room today who feels shame piling up on you and sometimes you don't know how to handle it. There's a There's a real clear word from the Lord in my spirit for somebody in this room today. God's gonna help some people get up in Jesus' name. This is not a house of condemnation. It's not a house where we're burying those who already feel like they're in a grave. I'm telling you, if you feel like you're in a grave, Jesus came to call your name and jerk you out of that grave. And we're gonna get the, hey, we're gonna get the grave clothes off of you in the name of the Lord. How many know there's too much living to do to be thinking about staying dead? How many know there's too much hope in Christ for us to give up now? I want to talk about recovering from failure. Recovering from failure. Psalm chapter 32, when you have it, say amen. The text reads like that. We're going to read the whole psalm. I like the whole psalm. We're going to read the whole psalm this morning. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Mm, Whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Listen to this. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you. In a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. For you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. How many see the capital M in your Bible? This is God talking to David. The first part of this psalm is David talking about the faithfulness of God. But somewhere in this song, and I'll teach that in just a moment, David stops writing from his first person experience and he begins to prophesy under the unction of the Holy Spirit. And he said, and God says through David, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Precious Jesus, thank you. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle 
else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he or she who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. How many are thankful for that? Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy. Now, you missed it. Shout for joy. All of you who are upright in heart, shout for joy. All of you who are upright in heart. And I want to preach today, recovering from failure. Look at someone today, tell them God's going to help us all get up today. Jesus, help the people of God and help the preacher today. I pray today the anointing that breaks the yoke would just fall on this house, fall on Athens, fall on Chattanooga, fall on every campus. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would do a work. I pray that you would give the word. I pray we would make it clear. I pray there'd be no hindrance, no feelings of weirdness, no condemnation, nobody trying to figure out how did he know that. Holy Ghost, you know everything. Read the mail today. Read the mail today. I pray somebody would get so uncomfortable that they don't hide their sin anymore, that they'd find forgiveness as they confess it to you. Today this room becomes an operating table and the sickness of sin will be removed by the grace of God. I praise you, Lord, that what the enemy intended beyond this point will remain unfulfilled. Today is an interruption of the devil's plan. It's a rescue mission. Somebody who felt like they were lost, alone, and would not recover, they're getting up from it all, and they're going to recover in the name of Jesus. And we give you praise for it this morning. Somebody help me praise God for it. Somebody help me praise God for it. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I am, there are things in the Word of God that sometimes you read and you think, how can that be so? How can a virgin have a baby? How can a man go fishing, catch a fish, open the fish's mouth and have the money in the mouth of the fish to pay his tax bill for the year? How can a man get out of a boat and walk on water? How can a man take five loaves and two fish and pray a prayer of blessing and multiply it and feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? There are things in the Bible that are just, I mean, they defy normal understanding. But I think one of the scriptures and one of the passages that is most perplexing to me as I read it is the passage about a king who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart, King David. A man after God's own heart, and yet the Bible does not sanitize his journey. It does not remove all of the Jerry Springer episodes from his life. It, it shows just how dysfunctional the king really is. David is a man, if you look throughout the scriptures, you will find a man who has some really horrific seasons of sin. And yet, in spite of the fact that his resume that is blotted and blotched with sin and failure is, is in the text, it is not hidden from our eyes, God still says David is a man after his heart. I want to tell you and just encourage some people this morning, that, and, and listen to me carefully, that is not an invitation to go sin like David. Sin doesn't have dominion over us. But it is a reminder that you can go through seasons of horrible failure and still love God. I say that, and I knew coming into this message today, and I'm, I hope you'll understand what I'm saying when I get ready to say what I'm fixing to say. In this city, this message might be a bit resisted because this is a, we're in a real churchy city. What I have found being your pastor for the last several months is that churchiness ain't getting the job done. There's a lot of broken humanity that need to know the power of the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. 
I am terribly convinced that sometimes, and, and, and I'm going to preach this, and if you're a good preacher when it comes to the subject of sin, you have to strike the balance, and, and not the balance of the grace of God, but strike the balance and make sure you are heard in saying that what you preach when you preach a message like this is not an invitation to go sin. If a person hears what I'm going to say today and says, oh, that means I can go get away with sin, you've not read your Bible. Paul says in the book of Romans, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. In other words, the grace of God is not a license for you to get away or I to get away with as much sin as we can and still claim to be a child of God. Grace is not a license to sin. Hear me, grace is power to overcome sin. Grace is not just getting up. Grace is walking forward without the bondage of that sin being on your life. But I am terribly afraid that in our attempt, uh, sometimes we have this, this, we want to be perceived as, as having it all together and being holy, and especially in a city where there are so many churches, it feels like everywhere you go, it's just this expectation of perfection. And I'm gonna let something out of the bag today. Everybody in the city is screwed up. Everybody in Chattanooga is screwed up. Athens, I love you. Everybody in Athens is screwed up. We all need Jesus. We all need the grace of God. We all need mercy to get up every morning and to walk with him. And I don't care how long you've been serving him and I don't care how many tongues you talk in and I don't care how many sermons you preach and I don't even care how many gifts of the spirit you may have. I want you to know that without the grace of God, we are miserable people on our way to hell. We do not deserve to be born again. We could not earn this salvation for we are saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God which is eternal life. And you can have seasons of failure and still love God. But I want to make sure that your sins, that we understand that our acts of sin do not become seasons of sin. Because seasons of sin that go unchecked become lives of sin. And I don't want you or anyone else to think that a person who is truly born again normalizes sin. Sin is not our friend. People are like freaking out. This I, I wish you could see the faces of people that I'm teaching and they're like, why is he screaming? About? We, we, we've actually come to a place in the church where we think when we're told we can't sin or we shouldn't sin, we actually feel like someone's taking something away from us. Oh, they're putting legalism and religion on me. That's because you have been incorrectly informed about sin. Sin is not your friend. In fact, the wages of sin is death. James chapter one, I'm gonna get, it's gonna get better in a minute. Let me talk about sin and make everybody mad. Then we'll get to the grace and everybody will get happy. Hallelujah. James one says that let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted to sin and neither will God tempt any man or woman to sin. I wanna fix something right there and we'll finish that passage in just a second. God doesn't tempt you to sin. He doesn't set up a temptation scenario to see if you pass the test. That is not how God operates. God doesn't lead his children into temptation. Why do you say that? Because some people who fall into sin actually think they fell into it because God tested them but didn't give them the strength to overcome it. That devil is a liar. God doesn't tempt his children to sin. So where does sin come from? 
James tells you, if you keep reading James 1, 15 and 16, let no man say when they are tempted, they are tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted, neither will he tempt man with sin. But man is tempted to sin when he is drawn away by his own lust. And when lust is conceived, I'm gonna teach it, it brings forth sin. When sin gets finished, it brings forth death. Sin is not our friend if it's leading us to death. I don't care how much fun you have while you're sinning, and there is some fun to have while you are sinning, but the devil never shows you the end of the sin. When you see these pictures of everybody drinking Corona and they're all uh, laying around in bikinis and everyone's having a great time on the beach getting blasted by alcohol or, or, or whatever they're doing, it looks fun, so let's go do that. But it doesn't show the car accident and it doesn't show the broken marriage and it doesn't show the hangover and it doesn't show the shame. Why? Because none of those things sell. The only thing that sells is pleasure and sometimes what is in us wants the pleasure we see yes. Satan will offer you and I opportunities to sin yes. the lust that goes unchecked in us watch if the lust in me connects with the opportunity Satan has presented conception happens it's what James teaches. It's actually a physical term. It's a medical term that he uses. Conception occurs in your heart when your eyes see something that Satan has presented and you say, I want, I want that. So the door gets open, the opportunity is presented, the invitation is given, and we say, well, I think I'll take that. And when lust conceives with the opportunity of sin, sin is birthed in our heart. When sin goes undealt with, it produces death. That's what it says. I didn't say this, the book said this. Sin produces death. We all know people who have died prematurely because of sin. People whose lives have been snuffed out early ahead of time because of sin. I want to just make sure you understand today. Why are you talking about this in the beginning of this message? Because I want to make sure you understand today. Sin is not your friend. It's an enemy. If you think it's just not harmful, it's, it's actually the most harmful thing on the planet. It's the most damaging, destructive, deathly thing on this planet. Sin will destroy your mind, your heart, your body. It'll destroy your confidence. It'll destroy relationships. Sin is not to be trifled with. It is to be dealt with. So how does a man who has an issue with sin and has had horrible seasons of sin, how does he become a man after God's own heart? For that, we go to Psalm 32. He tells us. This is actually brilliant to me because this, this psalm, Psalm 32, if you look at the top of your Bible, most of the Bibles, some not all, but many of the Bibles have the word a miskal of David. How many see that? A, 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 a maskel of David. And, and that word in the Hebrew is a song. This is a song of David. Think about this. David, in spite of all of the seasons of failure that he has, he comes to Psalm 32. Psalm 32 was actually sung among the Hebrew people as a testimony of the faithfulness of God. What's the point? Out of all the painful seasons of David's life, David had a song about it all at the end. They sang this song as a testimony of the faithfulness of God. They didn't sing the song while he was going through it, but when he looked back over his life, he started throwing up his hands, giving God praise, and they wrote this song, and this was a song that gave praise to God. I wanna let somebody in this, in this room know this today. No one wants to tro make a trophy out of, uh, uh, out of the seasons of sin and the seasons of failure that we've all experienced, but I do got some good news for you. You can sing about the sin God has forgiven 
holding you from. And one day, whether it is today or not, I want you to know the confidence that you need and the strength that you need and the recovery that you need is going to come and you will no longer drop your head and talk about how bad you were and how horrible you were. There is coming a day where you will stand in the confidence of the goodness of God and we will sing again about the faithfulness, the forgiveness, and the goodness of God. Somebody give God praise in this room. You will not be a victim of your seasons of sin. You will not be defined by seasons of sin. I tell you, we don't remember. Listen, I know that we read about them, but when we think about David, I don't think about adulterer. I don't think about murderer. I don't think about someone who numbered the people of Israel when God told him, when I think about David, I think about Saul is slain his thousands. David is tens of thousands. David was a man after God's own heart. We call him the sweet psalmist of Israel. What does all this mean? It means you don't have to be defined by your failure if you understand how to get up when you've fallen down. How do you recover from failure? How do you recover from seasons of sin? Well, I don't sin. Well, touch you. First of all, you're lying. I don't mean you live in sin, but you know that if you take inventory of your life, there's probably some places in every one of our attitudes where we need to become more like Jesus. <laughs> you start talking about sin and religious people start thinking, yeah, I don't do any of that. I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't run with those that do. <laughs> but if you're racist, you're a sinner. Welcome to Redemption to the Nation's Church. Huh? Yeah. If you don't like, if you don't love people, you're not really born again. If, if you're a liar, you're a sinner. If you see, what we have done now is we have become so Americanized in our understanding of sin that if it's not homosexuality, well, we could just run right down through it. If it's not all of this LGBTQ, that's the only sins most churches are nervous about. I am far more nervous about your gossiping tongue than I am you turning out to be a homosexual. I'm, I'm, far, I'm far more nervous about lying and deception. And we're far more interested in demonizing people who are very, very different than us when we have our own skeletons that need to get under the blood. It's tight, but it's right. And, and, and here's what I want you to hear me say. In order for us to move forward and recover from sin, we have to stop telling ourselves that we're okay when we know we've done something that has offended God. The scripture says, well, I like when you preach and holler. I'm just going to rebuke today. How about that? And we'll heal it all up at the end. The scripture says this, verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Anybody other than me, when you have dealt with a season of sin, you don't get to get away with it like all your other friends who didn't know God. Who am I talking to? I mean, I, I saw people doing stuff and I thought to myself, I'm gonna try that. They tried it and had a great time. I tried it and was miserable. We just got back from, uh, uh, where did we go? Uh, Panama City Beach. Panama City Beach. We were just at Panama City Beach with 260 students from our school for Immersion Week, and the Lord moved in such a mighty way. It was glorious, and we're grateful for that. But I had a flashback. 
I went with Pastor Rick and Carolyn and Samuel to a place called Sharky's for Samuel's 21st birthday, and we, I took them, and, and, and I wanted to take them to get lunch, and they have this, uh, this history. They do this every year at Immersion. On Immersion, they take Samuel to Sharky's for his birthday. It's a great place to eat. It's also the first and only time in my life I sipped alcohol. I'm gonna get from that. Y'all are like, oh my God, he tasted alcohol. <laughs> Boy, y'all are so holy today. I'm telling you, you guys are something else. Just amazing. I remember being on, my mother, for some strange reason, let me go to spring break with my friends. She trusted me. I was a tongue-talking Jesus kid. And I go to mom and I say, my best buddy, who was a preacher's kid, he, he's going to Panama City Beach for spring break. Can I go with him? And mom says, well, I guess it's okay. Just call me and keep me posted. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> never tasted alcohol in my life. Never saw debauchery like that. I go to Sharky's. We're sitting at Sharky's this past week. I had a flashback. It's the only place I've ever tasted alcohol in my life. I go to Sharky's and I, I drink this. I don't even know. I think it was called Jungle Juice. Kool-Aid and vodka. I don't know. They told me. I tasted one sip of it. The hand of the Lord. Some of y'all are like, I'm not coming back here next week. He drank Jungle Juice 30 years ago. What is wrong with you people? I tasted that, it, it went down in my mouth. I felt the heavy hand of God come on. I laid in a bed one night on that spring break in Panama City. Everyone else is drunk out of their mind. I'm laying in the bed weeping. <laughs> I'm not talking about, oh Jesus. I'm talking about sobbing and everybody's like, what in the world is wrong with Wallace? <laughs> the heavy hand of God. I want to tell some of you, the greatest friend some of you have when you sin is the misery that comes with your sin. Some people don't get miserable when they sin. I want to praise God this morning for the misery I have felt when I did something that did not please the Lord. There's a passage over in the, in the epistle of Peter. It says that godly sorrow leads to repentance Worldly sorrow leads to death. What does that mean? It means that those who don't know God when they sin, they feel bad sometimes about their sin way after they've sinned, but they're not really sorry it broke the heart of God. What they're really sorry about is that they got caught, that they lost their marriage, that they lost everything they had. But that's not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is, Kevin, that's not for you. And if I let you keep doing that, thinking it's all right, then you'll keep doing it and eventually it could destroy your life. So instead of not touching your heart, I'd rather let my heavy hand rest on you and let you know what it feels like, watch, to step out from underneath my covering. Someone in this room today is miserable, which is a very good sign that you're born again and that you need to get right, get some things right with God today. David said, while I was silent, my bones grew old. That is not simply some psychosomatic way of articulating some sort of spiritual grief. David literally had physical repercussions in his body because of what he was not dealing with in his heart. This is actually now a study they've done. People who hold on to things and do not get forgiveness for them, it's like, it's like corroding to the body. It's like cancerous. You get bitter with somebody and don't forgive the bitterness. If you hold on to it for a long time, it'll destroy your heart. It's like stress buildup. You just gotta, you gotta, we've got to learn how to recover. If you and I don't learn the power of recovery, watch, acts of sin will become seasons of sin. Seasons of sin that go unchecked will become lives of sin. You are not permitted to live a lifestyle of sin as a child of God. 
So David says, listen to me, the greatest friend of sin is silence. When you and I remain silent, it empowers the sin to remain around our neck like choking us. David says, when I remain silent, my bones grew old. He says, day and night, your hand, has anybody ever had this experience? Day and night, you felt the conviction of God about something? Come on, don't lie. That's another sin, don't lie. <laughs> day and night, the hand of the Lord was heavy upon me. My vitality, my energy, my charisma, my life, it become like a drought in the summer. Sin has a way of sucking the life of God, the joy of the Lord. Sin has a way of taking that peace that passes understanding. David said, and the key to me living in this, the, the reason I stayed in this season is connected to one thing, my silence. What is he talking about? Is it that he didn't talk? No. He remained silent about what he knew was going on in his heart. It was as if he walked around thinking he could hide his sin from God. So while I remained silent, my bones grew old. The vitality of me became like a summer drought. The hand of the Lord was on me day and night. I was miserable. Something happens in the story. With one word, it shifts. He said, I acknowledged my sin to you. He confessed his sin. Why do we remain in silence? If you're taking notes, let me give you two reasons why you and I remain in silence when it comes to our sin. We sin and we don't say anything about it as if God doesn't know. <laughs> I have two, I have like 100 kids, but I have two that are, both in diapers. Genesis is two years old, going on 21. <laughs> and sometimes she does things that she doesn't think I see. So I, I have no clue what it is. It's just, perhaps it's just us, I don't know. But Genesis is in the stage of life. She lives her entire life through what she puts in her mouth. Everything has to be tasted. Chewing gum off the ground, concrete chairs she sits on at the ice cream, everything has to be tasted. I, I'm, I have no clue where, she, I have to rebuke it. I have to pray it. I have to, God, deliver her from this. But it's, I take her home last night, giving her an Asher a bath. I throw, she loves, they love to have coloring things in the water. So the water of the bath gets covered. So she wants, when I throw it in, she puts it in her mouth. She has, it looks like she's dying. I mean, she has red stuff coming all and I said to her, Genesis, where, and I knew. I mean, she's wearing red all over her. And I said, where is the bath color? I don't know. <laughs> she's trying to hide the fact that she, I told her not to, like 10 times. You see this? I'm gonna put her in the water. Do not put her in your mouth, okay? Okay, 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 okay. Put her in the bathtub, turn around to get the shampoo, turn back around. Isn't that like us sometimes? So we're silent and we try to hide it. Why do we do that? I'm gonna give you two reasons. Number one, we're in denial. Number two, we're deflecting and blaming it on someone else. Okay. There are times we justify our sin by deflecting to somebody else. I did this because they did this to me. Let me help you understand something. God is far too kind and way too wise to put someone else's future, put your future in someone else's hands, okay? Well, they did this to me and I'm gonna get them back. That sounds real scriptural, doesn't it? I want you to understand today that when God saves you and I, we don't have the privilege of blaming our, I'm not saying what they did wasn't real. I'm not even saying what they did wasn't painful. I am telling you that what they did cannot trigger you into a pattern of sin. If so, you have put more 
of your energy in people than you are faith in God. That has to stop. And so when we sin, we actually, you know, we, we do crazy things sometimes and we, we keep going as if we don't have to repent for what we did because what they did made us do what we did. They cut me off. That's why I flipped them a bird. <laughs> they lied to me, so I lied back. <laughs> that's, that's the nature of, an, of a carnal heart. Don't spend your time blaming everyone else for your sin. David said in Psalm 51, and my, by the way, many theologians believe that Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 were, were, were sister companions. It, it's from the same man. Most think about the same season of his life. David said in Psalm 51, after he had been a, addressed by Nathan about his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, her husband, David, listen to what David said. Against you and against you only have I sinned. So you don't have the privilege of deflecting blame when it comes to your sin. Don't let their sin become a reason for you to sin. See it as an invitation from the enemy and don't accept the RSVP. The enemy sends you an RSVP to the table of sin and offense. Don't take the bait. Secondly, the reason we remain silent is because we're in denial. I didn't do that. Just like Genesis says, I didn't, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Stuff all over her and she, she did it and she's in denial about it. As if being silent and denying it somehow makes God forget about it. And there comes a point in David's life where he's failed God miserably. He's in a season of sin and how does he get up? He acknowledges what he did and confesses it out of his mouth. Now, I want to tell you something, and I'm wrapping up here. One of the most dangerous heresies floating around in the church today is that Christians do not need to repent of sin. It invites silence, which prolongs the heavy hand of God on your life. When you tell people, you're a Christian, you don't need to repent of sin. You're saved and God's already forgiven. He has forgiven it, but he forgave you when you believed, according to the book of Romans, with a heart man believeth unto salvation, uh, uh, unto salvation and with a mouth confession is made. You had to confess with your mouth to get born again. What makes us think we could get saved by confession and get forgiveness as we continue in this journey and sometimes we fall down and have forgiveness of those sins without confession from the same. It's coming not into agreement with the sin. It is acknowledging sin to God who already knows about it. He already knows we've done it. He's waiting on us to recognize and acknowledge I did this. It was wrong. I, I don't have time to go into the depth of this. This is a whole other message. But it's interesting to me in the first two verses, there are three things that God dealt with and all of them are in that family of fallenness and family of failure. But he, he doesn't just use the word sin. He uses the word transgression, sin, and iniquity. Look at that. Just, just put that up there, Chad. We're gonna do Bible study real quick. Blessed, somebody say blessed. blessed. Come on, holler, say Blessed. Is he whose transgression is forgiven, sin is covered, and iniquity is not put on his account. These are three different Hebrew words because they all stand for something different. Transgression is when you rebel against God's law. Sin is the general term of doing what is evil, and iniquity is the idea in the Hebrew of the twisting. It's what the Hebrew word for iniquity is. It's this idea of twisting, and some theologians believe it's twisting the truth. Others believe it's having a twisted nature. I believe it's both. We have a twisted nature, and sometimes we twist the truth, and we want to make it our truth. 
I'm thankful today for the untwisting grace of God. How many know sometimes we get all twisted and we get all messed up in this life? Sometimes we sin and we miss the mark. Sometimes we transgress and rebel against God. And David said, I found the key to forgiveness from it all. I will not remain silent and I will not keep on doing it and I will not stay in it. I'm going to acknowledge it's wrong. And David said, when I acknowledged it was wrong, when I said, I will confess, verse five, my sins, my transgressions to the Lord, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That's a powerful thought. When I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, when you when you go into sin, and I, I say very carefully, go into sin, because some people say, when you fall into sin, or like you tripped, like you accidentally, no, most people do not trip into sin or accidentally sin. Most people put on, uh, they put on goggles and a nose thing, and, and they jump in the deep end of sin. This idea of, I don't know how I did this. You do know how. That's part of why we stay bound. We act like we don't know how we did this. I did this because I am a, I am a twisted man. I, am a, I need your grace. I need your mercy. I am throwing myself on the altar. We are not just decent people in need of a spiritual band-aid. We are depraved. We are, we, we are separated from God, and we're only brought near him by the love of Jesus and the grace of God. David said, I have not hidden my iniquity. Or I have not hidden my iniquity. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And when I did, you forgave the twistedness of my sin. Next verse, verse six. Look at this and I'm done. For this cause everyone who is godly will pray to you in a time when you may be found. How many know that's right now? Well, I have tomorrow. That's the, that's the language of a fool. Today is the day that the Lord's found. Today is the day of salvation. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near to him. Verse seven, keep going. Just, let's just keep walking through this. You are my hiding place. In one season, David's is feeling the heavy hand of God. In one season, his vitality has, has, has vanished like, like the summer drought stole the joy of God, the peace of God. In one season, he couldn't sleep day or night. And now he's testifying that God, God is my hiding place. This is the joy of sin forgiven. This is not merely a band-aid, watch. Watch, it goes back to verse one with, with me in this whole thing. How do you recover from failure? You get recovered. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, stand with me, I'm through preaching. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, give no place to the devil. He is not talking to sinners. He is talking to the church. And to the church folk, he says, give no place to the devil. I believe every time we walk into seasons of sin and we get in this pattern of we, this, this unrepented of, unacknowledged sin, I believe we're giving a place to the enemy. I believe we actually come out from under that covering of God's sweetness and goodness. David says, if you want to recover from failure, get recovered. Cover me, Lord. Cover my sin. If you don't let him cover you, you can't recover. If you spend your whole life trying to cover yourself, you'll never recover. But if you'll trust him and acknowledge your sin to him, you'll actually sing a song about his faithfulness. Somebody said, what sins are you talking about? I'm not talking about any kinds of sin. I'm talking about sin. The enemy of every man and woman in this room. And the good news is this. I found the cure for the sickness of sin. It's the mercy and the grace of God. 
I want this to be a recovery zone. This property, this sanctuary, this altar, these seats, that lobby, that youth department, that children's department, every square foot of this entire place and every person connected to this house, I want you to know you are signing up. We are declaring to be a recovery zone. Messed up people will find Jesus' love here. People who have failed will get back up again. There will be no judgment or condemnation to flow from this house. You're not gonna wear a scarlet letter around your neck all the days of your life. If the sun makes you free, you're gonna be free indeed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If I'm talking to you today and you say, Pastor Kevin, I, I, I needed this today. I just need to recover. I just wanna tell you as you prepare to come, when you come today, there'll be no judgment, nobody asking you what you're talking about, what did you do? We're just gonna love you and we're gonna pray for God to restore you. If I preached to you today and you want that peace that passes understanding, I'm talking to anybody who's listening, church member, non-church member, Christian, non-Christian, whoever it is, if you wanna get some stuff covered, recover and get up again, Get out of your seat and get to the altar right now and say, Pastor Kevin, I needed this today. I needed this today. People are already coming. God bless you all. In Athens, I want you to get up and get out of your seat if you need to recover. I want you to know that there is hope for you and that you can come and find the forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I don't care what you've done and how long you've been doing it. Come and acknowledge. Come and confess. Come and be forgiven. Come to an altar. Cast your burden on the Lord. He will take it from you and cleanse you. People are coming and I need saints to lift their hands in the altar, in their seat, wherever you are. If you know he's been faithful, lift your hands. If you know he's a forgiver, if you know he's a God who loves, lift your hands right now. I want you to, to just stretch your hands up to God and begin to thank him. Uh -huh. We're going to pray for people. Pastor Chris and Crystal are coming, but the grace of God is flowing in this altar for new beginnings. I'm telling you right now, I so believe in the grace of God in this altar today. I don't care what you've done. If you'll just step into this altar today, there's going to meet you. What's going to meet you is grace and mercy. Grace that is greater than every sin. Come today. People are coming. God bless you. People are coming. God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I want someone to come and sing that song this morning, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Come on, lift your hands. Great. Hey family, I believe God is touching hearts right now. The preached word of God causes the lost to come to Christ. I believe someone's watching. Maybe you feel a million miles away from God. Maybe you've been in church. Maybe you've never been in church. Listen, I want to tell you that it doesn't matter where you are in life right now. If you want Christ to save you, no matter what you've done and no matter how long you've been doing it, if you'll turn your heart to him, he'll save you right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. Say, dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I'm asking you to save me from my sin. Save me from myself. Lord, come in and be the king of my life. I give you my past, my present, and my future. And I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to rescue me today. In Jesus' name, by faith, I believe that I'm saved and a child of God. Amen. Listen, friend. I know that's a simple prayer, but I believe with all of my heart, salvation is as simple as turning from sin and turning to Christ. If you did that today, I, I wanna pray that God give you a strong Bible-believing church. I want you to go to kevinwallace.tv, learn how the resources that we have can help you in your journey. Listen, we wanna pray for you. Drop us a line on the prayer request. Let us know you gave your heart to Christ, and our team's gonna be praying for you this coming week. You're gonna get stronger. You're gonna grow deeper in your love for God. You're going to become everything he put you on this planet to be. I'm praying for you. I love you. I'll see you next week. God bless.